I think there's still a couple seats over here. Thank you all for coming. This is the <laughs> Bay Guardian Council of Community Housing Organization and Urban Idea panel and community discussion on Planet Bay Area and future regional planning and how it affects San Francisco. Thank you all for being here. The way this is going to work, I'm going to give a little brief introduction. I'm going to turn it over to our panelists, and then we're going to leave plenty of time at the end for people to ask questions, throw all ideas. This is not a one-way conversation. You're all here because you're part of the conversation, and we want to hear from you what you're thinking about, what your response is, what you hear here tonight, and frankly, what we can do next, what the next step will be. So, we're here because San Francisco is facing the most dramatic demographic changes changes in the makeup of the city that we've seen in a generation. And some of that is because of the tech boom, which we've seen before, but I don't think anyone's ever seen anything quite like this, and the gentrification that comes with that. But some of it is also because of very specific plans that are being made, that are looking at how land ought to be used in San Francisco and the Bay Area now and over the next 25 years. And we've spent a lot of time looking at what those plans are and what they mean. And that's one of the things we're going to be talking about tonight. The background on this is that a few years ago, the California State Legislature decided that they wanted to fight greenhouse gases and global climate change. But they didn't want to, for example, tax gasoline or put a lot of money into public transit or anything like that. Instead, they came up with this idea of SB 375 and the Sustainable Community Strategy. The idea of this is something that's derived from what's called smart growth, which some environmentalists have been into for a while. The idea being, we're going to concentrate growth in already developed urban areas through infill development. And by doing that, we'll get people to stop driving from the suburbs to jobs in San Francisco. They'll be living near their jobs in San Francisco because that's where we're gonna build the new housing. And then they'll take buses or they'll take transit. And by doing this, we will reduce greenhouse gases, which sounds just brilliant in theory. And you can see how somebody came up with this idea and said this is going to work. But there's a lot of problems with it. Um, the, just so you know, there's going to be some acronyms thrown around tonight. Um, I'm going to give you a primer. ABAG is the Association of Bay Area Governments. MTC is the Metropolitan Transportation Commission. They are the two agencies that were tasked by the state legislature with figuring out how to draft a sustainable communities strategy plan for the Bay Area. All right? They are a regional government agency. They do not have direct control over land use in San Francisco, but they do have a lot of influence because they control a fair amount of money. Um, SCS is the Sustainable Community Strategy that I just talked about. PDA is what's known as Priority Development Areas. These are on some of the maps that you see around here. Priority Development Areas are the orange on this map. Those are the areas that ABAG and MTC think development should go into. This is where we should increase urban density. Um, there's also a term, COC, Community of Concern. We're going to talk about that tonight too. Communities of Concern are primarily low-income communities of color that are a threat for displacement. And one of the fun things we'll see tonight if you look at the map over there is if you look at the priority development areas and you look at the Communities of Concern and you put them on top of each other, guess what? It's the same essential map. All right. um, what this means for San Francisco in quick terms is 280,000 more people, 92,000 more housing units, and 73,000 more cars. And that's my estimate because one of the things that ABAG and MTC have done after they've done all of this work to make sure that we're going to get people out of our cars is assume that we're not going to get people out of their cars and they're going to keep on driving. What's missing in this whole plan is several things. One is a way to stop displacement because there are people already living where they want to put in new high density market rate housing. And we've seen how that's worked in San Francisco. Um, there's really not a lot in this plan that looks seriously at how to decrease, decrease driving and improve transit. There's really not a huge recognition, and some of you got this map when you walked in, of the fact that a lot of these priority development areas are going to be underwater in 50 years. Nor is there money for any of it. What it would take to improve Muni and improve BART to the point where we could actually handle all of these people is a very big number that is not in this plan, nor is there any way that we can actually get that money. So what we're going to talk about tonight is all of that and also what do we do now. Obviously there's a need for regional planning. We're not, people are going to say, oh no, 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 every little community should be an island. This needs to be done, it needs to be done in a different way that takes into account justice and equity issues. Um, 
We need to look at what the ABAG plan is and how we can influence and try to change that. Um, we also need to recognize that a lot of these battles are going to play out right here in San Francisco because we still control land use in San Francisco. And essentially, ABAG can say, I want 280,000 more people in this town and you're going to build 92,000 more housing units. But San Francisco still has the right to say, wait, we want them here, we want them here. We don't want them, and this is the fact that we want. Oh. And in the end, all, the other thing we have to think about is what the state is doing to us. Because the state is essentially saying, through SB 375, we want you to do this. What they're not saying is, we're going to give you the tools to fight displacement. Because what they've done is taken those away through the Ellis Act and through Costa Hawkins and a lot of other things that we'll be talking about tonight. At that point, I'm going to stop talking. And I want to introduce our panel. We have a great panel tonight, people who have looked at this issue, who have thought about this a lot, and who are going to have a lot of things to say. As I say, at the end, we'll have plenty of time for questions. We have Mike Casey, who's the head of Unite Here Local 2. Yeah, Mike. <laughs> We have Maria Zamudo, who is with Casa Justa Descartes. We have Cindy Wu, who is a member of the San Francisco Planning Commission. We have Bob Allen, who is with Urban Habitat. And we have Danny Fujioka, who is with the Chinatown Community Development Corporation. At this point, I'm going to turn it over to Gen, who is going to go through and amplify some of the things I've talked about and kind of give you a much longer background on what we're talking about here tonight. Yeah. Eight units in the building in the she is the last 
remaining uh, a family in the building. Everyone else is gone. She's been served with a summons complaint a couple weeks ago. Um, and I'll just tell a little bit about her story. Uh, she was a garment worker. Uh, her uh, husband, uh, she's 73, her husband's a few years older. He was a, a restaurant worker. Uh, they are basically the working class family uh, of San Francisco. Uh, they have a number of children, uh, one, uh, one's deceased, uh, others have, have moved across the country, um, uh, mostly because in search of jobs. Um, they live with a, a disabled daughter uh, who needs uh, uh, point fire care. Um, and, uh, they, and, and they pay about $800 rent for the unit. Um, they happen to live uh, two blocks away uh, from the Van Ness BRT, which is a, one of the uh, creative um, uh, transit ideas that the city is advancing. Uh, uh, they're two blocks away from the, the future site of uh, one of the stations. Um, and, and this is um, uh, this pattern of displacement and evictions um, is uh, around transit is one of the phenomena that has been uh, well documented. Uh, there's a close connection between improving transit in urban areas and displacement. And a lot of what we need to talk about is what does that mean in a city like San Francisco. Uh, scene two, um, on yesterday. Um, and, you know, I think Mayor Lee's statement, which was quoted as well in the paper, and this was part of a very interesting Q&A uh, yesterday, uh, uh, both around the SES and also around displacement uh, po questions posed by uh, uh, Super Supervisor Mar and Supervisor Avalos. Um, and you know, I, I, I we laugh, but actually, this is I think this is a true statement. Uh, maybe there are cities that have better anti-displacement policies, but uh, uh, we need to learn about them. But I, I think San Francisco, certainly within the region, is is viewed as a model. Uh, and, and indeed, my, many of the recommendations for preventing displacement in other cities are uh, is basically to adopt the San Francisco model. Um, if, if we have the best, the toughest anti-displacement um, policies uh, in the nation, uh, this, this, I, I thought this data was, was Striking was provided by a graduate student at UC Berkeley. Uh, uh, his name, uh, uh, Clayton. Uh, anyway, now, yeah, I think he's out of touch now. But, uh, but in any case, what this data shows is the decline of the African American population in the city. I can uh, see it in the back. And and what you see is a the decline on one hand, the declining numbers of the San Francisco population. The rising number is the population in San Joaquin County, out of the region. Uh, and indeed, as we trace displacement of, of, of African Americans and other communities of color, we've seen them scattered across the region. So if we have the best, the toughest anti-displacement policy in the country, then we are in some trouble. Um, uh, so as as Tim mentioned, I'll go this very briefly. There are two mandates for, for Plan Bay Area, uh, or the SES, which Plan Bay Area is, is, is uh, a response to. One is to reduce greenhouse gases, uh, and the other is to plan for sufficient housing um, for growth, uh, to address 100% of the region's projected growth. Um, now, it doesn't say, it, it, the plan doesn't have to guarantee that they actually get produced, but you have to plan and, so, and, and zone sufficient land in the area for production. So the, the plan that was produced, plan the area, um, uh, looked at six different alternatives. And I, I'm not going to go through them. Um, uh, but basically, the ones that we're going to talk about today are the preferred plan, uh, the, the, stra uh, the PDA strategy, the strategy that relies upon priority of uh, 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 pushing development into planned development areas, or priority development areas, as Tim referred to earlier. And then there is 
um, really through advocacy on the community side throughout the region. The region was, was compelled to um, come up with a, I think if you're familiar with the CEQA process, you're supposed to look at different alternatives. They actually had some very you know, divergent uh, uh, models, but one that didn't really prioritize equity. And so one alternative strategy was uh, proposed. Uh, and we'll talk more about it. I'm sure some of the other panelists will speak to about it later, but there were two that were proposed. Uh, well, there were six. But this one, uh, the, the, the equity environmental jobs um, alternative um, was also analyzed. This is the um, map um, of, of the priority development areas um, that are designated by uh, basically cities nominate areas where they uh, propose to um, grow jobs and build housing. Uh, and uh, there's some other criteria, but basically uh, this is not something that's imposed on us by the region. This is something that each municipality, cities, uh, counties uh, propose to do. And as you can see, um, almost all, if not all, uh, of the eastern side of the city uh, is proposed for that growth. Um, and let me say, I think we should, so, uh, some of the conversations we had before, you know, I, I, I think as we talk about growth and increasing density, I, I don't think those of us on the panel are opposed to growth or density um, uh, per se, but we're, we're, we're interested in, in equitable growth and development, and it's certainly interesting that there is none of it on the west side. So here are some of the, the, the numbers. Um, uh, so, 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 so to take a step back, basically through a, the, 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 um, the, the, the uh, MTAs and ABAGs uh, modeling, MTCs and ABAGs modeling, they, they started allocating growth uh, both in terms of jobs and in, in housing uh, uh, based upon uh, the areas that cities had basically volunteered up for development. And the model, what it did is basically is, is try to reduce the amount of travel uh, to reduce the amount of greenhouse gas produced by, by cars and trucks. That, that is basically the, is the, um, is the is enormous from, um, computer, and that's, they spewed out these numbers, and they allocated growth reporting. And so San Francisco is, 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 is slated for an incredible amount of job growth. Um, and as the mayor said yesterday in his response to uh, Supervisor Avalos' uh, comments, this is the city's agenda to grow jobs. Uh, and he commented about how um, there are 35 cranes on our skyline, uh, and, and these are bringing jobs to um, uh, the city. Um, the, um, along with that, um, there is uh, uh, the, the, the computer allocated housing growth. And so San Francisco, well, not the uh, the, the, the largest share of, of housing growth is taking um, a, a very significant um, increase. Um, it is the largest of, um, uh, in, in, in terms of, of um, uh, you know, total uh, growth, you can see that uh, it, it ranks with San Jose with, and I, I forget, I did the numbers a little earlier, but we have a really a fraction of the land mass that San Jose has. Um, and yet we're taking uh, 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 close to um, the growth that um, San Jose is proposing. This is a, 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 a map um, of uh, 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 sort of zeroed in on, on the development areas within San Francisco. Um, and the areas that are colored, this is the priority um, uh, development areas and the areas that are in purple are the areas where the city is anticipating, planning department is anticipating the most amount of increased density. Uh, the, the large uh, dots are where they're proposing affordable housing. Um, uh, to mention earlier um, the communities of concern. Um, this is uh, uh, a, uh, there, there's a, sort of a, a number of factors that, that lead to the definition of a community of concern, but as Tim 
but, but and, and these are the communities that are going to be most vulnerable to displacement. And as Tim mentioned, they all, almost uh, are contiguous with the uh, areas of, 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 of growth and, and, and development. Um, incidentally, there's a, there's a, there's a great um, sort of interactive um, mapping uh, tool on MTC's website to, to look at each of these census tracts uh, in terms of the population. Um, the uh, plan itself also um, uh, conceded uh, and, 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 and acknowledged that, that um, the net result of the uh, of Plan B area uh, will result in uh, displacement, increased displacement. And, and what you see here in this, um, in particular in the community uh, of concern, so the, the, I don't know if you can see it very clearly, but no, the, 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 you can see that actually the proposed project proposes the, the greatest amount of impact on communities of concern, that's 36%. Um, and then the alternative five is at 21 percent. So uh, I think it's it's telling that overall in this region, basically the the PDA strategy is going to grow growth in areas that are going to most uh, that, that, that put uh, you know, minorities and low-income communities at greatest risk. And yet this is the preferred plan. Um, but they have an answer, um, and uh, this is actually the response to uh, comments uh, of concern uh, submitted by many organizations about this uh, increased risk. And so, in Abed's response is that this, we, we will build housing and we'll create economic opportunities. Um, that is just. Um, so don't worry. And the model actually, the, 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 the analysis of the EIR um, said, well, there's, there may be local displacement, but don't worry, because we're going to build housing across the region, it'll legalize. So, um, and, 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 um, so it, it was a peculiar logic. Uh, I, okay, but, I mean, but anyway, that, the EIR said, don't worry. There is not a significant, uh, there's not going to be a significant regional displacement because we plan 100% for the housing, for the housing need. So it's important at this point, I'm going to throw out a little bit more data for people to, you know, sort of risk for the discussion. Um, so that, because I think to some extent one has to look behind the data, the, the, the model, to, 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 to analyze the results. Um, so, uh, uh, I, I pulled together some data on, uh, based upon actual housing production in the city and kind of the area of projected growth. Um, they're proposing more than 3,000 units of construct, new, new construction, net new, each year for the, for the next 30 years. Um, we have only done that, we've only exceeded 3,000 twice, but the average is close to 1,600. Um, so, and, but I think the data speaks for itself. Um, next question: Can we make this affordable? Um, uh, Choo Choo, uh, uh, they have they, they, the the plan there doesn't actually identify what the breakout is of how much affordable housing needs produced. But Choo Choo did some analysis that based upon existing um, uh, trends uh, or basic uh, the, the allocation. Um, we're looking at producing 34,000 units. Um, basically, the city's rule of thumb is that it takes about $200,000 of subsidy to build uh, an affordable unit. That would mean that we need $6.8 billion. Uh, we just fought very hard. Uh, most of you in the room were on, uh, with us on this, and we, 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 we passed Prop C, which is going to generate $1.3 billion. Uh, through um, 2030. Um, this is actually, I mean, no other city has done this in the region. Um, and, um, uh, and yet we're, we're, we're going to fall. Um, one last slide. This, because, you know, MTC ABAG has reassured us that there's two solutions to displacement. One is we'll build, and the other is economic opportunity. 
This is a projection uh, provided by the Mayor's Office of Housing of uh, where, uh, and I'm sorry, you can't read the bottom line, but this is, the, this is jobs that were uh, uh, projected for uh, the, the, the income of, of, of the jobs that are being created in San Francisco. Uh, and that tallest column is less than 50% of AMI. <coughs> And the one on the far side, barely viewed in my screen, is 150. So you can you can see. Well, say what AMI is. Oh, uh, adjusted. Um, Very <laughs> Great, thank you very much, guys. So I think everybody can see the issue here, right? The, the, I'm sorry. I, I, I just looked up at Sue Hester and I said, oh my god, there's one more slide. <laughs> um, there is another issue, uh, and that involves CEQA. And, 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 and the, there were uh, there were a number of changes within uh, SB 375, and one of them was to propose a stream, a CEQA streamlining process. Um, and uh, we were assured that this is this is California Environmental Quality Act. Oh, Thank yeah. you. Um, and uh, and basically, what it allows uh, cities to do is cut through and eliminate some of this this, this nuisance. Uh, of, of CEQA and environmental review. Um, and uh, we'll, I think there'll be some further discussion about it. But again, uh, the, the various colors here show um, where there's, there's different forms of CEQA streamlining that SB 375 creates. And basically, all of San Francisco is covered by that map. Uh, and that is based upon access to transit, uh, primarily. But in any case, um, and, and so there was a very interesting exchange when the planning department presented before uh, before the commission a few weeks ago, uh, and the question was posed: So what does this mean for San Francisco? Which it looks like most of San Francisco is subject to sequence streamlining, and the director said, "Well, it's complicated." <laughs> uh, and. Um, uh, but don't worry, we are asking some questions. And actually, the mayor mentioned that yesterday. The mayor also mentioned that they posed some questions to MCTC to figure out what this actually means for San Francisco. Um, so uh, there you have it. Uh, uh, the plan, by the way, is, a, uh, is scheduled to be a, a, approved by MCTC and ABAG next month. Thank you again. I'm glad we didn't leave that out. People who have followed CEQA realize what that means. It means that a lot of the opposition to projects that we have used on environmental grounds is out the window. So anyway, you all see what Dan is talking about. You see the problem here. They are asking for something that San Francisco can't provide without wholesale displacement of existing communities. That's really what the bottom line is. Um, I just want to say before we go over to the panel, I have been asked to say two things. One is there's a lot of folks in the back if you want to kind of work your way in so that you can hear. Um, we got quite a crowd tonight. Um, we will be sending out the program from tonight as a PDF to people who didn't get programs. Make sure you leave your email address at the door if you want that. And the other thing is, this is being filmed. And if you want to know where you can see the film version of this and see yourselves all on video, um, make sure your email address is at the sign-up sheet in the back. There's a little space around the sides here if you want to make. Um, what? <laughs> Oh, we big data. No, actually, we're a very small data. <laughs> we're an email list. We're not big data. Um, and, and we're happy to share the email list with anybody there's no secrets here. Uh, at this point, why don't we, uh, Cindy Wu is on the Planning Commission, also was a community planner in Chinatown, has been in the middle of a lot of these discussions and what's going on for quite some time now. So why don't we have her take it from here, um, and then we'll go to the other panelists. Cindy. Hello. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. So I think I'll bring two perspectives. Um, thank you for the introduction. Thank you again for the presentation to this. So first I'll cover, I think, how we think this um, impacts Chinatown. 
and then maybe bring some thoughts about what this means for the planning department. So from the Chinatown point of view, we see this kind of large regional planning impacting the neighborhood in multiple ways. So let me say first that we really believe that Chinatown is a complete neighborhood already. It is dense. It has retail. It has residential. It has long-term institutions. It's really sort of what the Plan Bay Area is seeking to achieve, you know, these really complete neighborhoods. But we feel like the plan actually puts all this pressure on the neighborhood that disregards everything that exists, that these complete existing neighborhoods are really um, kind of barely an afterthought in this work. So one way that that is manifest is in housing. So again, showed that um, one of the major goals is to plan for and zone for uh, the significant production of housing. But in neighborhoods that are already built out, I think this is Chinatown, the Mission, TL, this equates to infill housing. And so what we see on the ground is LS Act evictions. What we see is pressure to kick out people that are existing, demolish those buildings, and then rebuild larger buildings there. Um, another way that we've seen this happen is through transit planning. So I think that one of the major messages I got from this is that the threat of displacement, I think, looks a little bit different than it had looked in the past, and that one of the major ways that this is happening is large transit projects. So the Van Ness BRT, um, I think many people in the gym are familiar with it, uh, BRT is bus rapid transit. So it eliminates all of the left-hand turns. If you're traveling southbound on Venice, it, the proposal is that it eliminates all the left-hand turns except for Broadway. And Broadway is the tunnel, or, uh, literally is the tunnel to Chinatown. And so if you think about all of the traffic, all of the autos coming from North Bay, coming from the marina, traveling to jobs in downtown and in Selma, all of that is going to be funneled through Chinatown. So at the same time, we've been working on uh, a new streetscape plan for Broadway um, for three blocks in Chinatown to improve pedestrian safety, to make sure that those small businesses are viable, to make sure that it doesn't feel like a freeway. But then, you know, then this proposal comes out at the same time. So I think that planning at this large regional level, it really just sort of discounts the hard work that neighborhoods have been doing for decades to try to get their neighborhoods more livable. Um, the, back to this idea of transit projects as sort of um, the genesis for, for some of the threats. I think that there's been this sort of subtle shift in, in transit. Uh, transit is now, I think because um, cities are so popular, everyone wants to move back to cities now, that transit has become somewhat of an amenity rather than a necessity. You know, what we see really is that people Poor folks in our neighborhoods, they just they need transit to get to their jobs, they need transit to go to the doctor, they, they, they ride it because they can't afford a car, or so on and on. But transit as an amenity, I think, for folks that um, want to live like a new urbanist lifestyle, not that there's anything wrong with that, but I think it's, it's shifting the conversation of what the need transit fills. So that brings me to ask then, is this plan sustainable and for who? You know, is it sustainable for commuters that want to commute from the North Bay to their jobs in the growing, growing Soma sector? Or is, is it sustainable for people that are already in <coughs> neighborhoods along these lines? Um, okay, so then shifting to an idea um, about how this impacts the planning department. I think that, so the planning department is finishing a long stream of um, neighborhood plans. Central Corridor is the last one. I think that the ideas in the plan Bay area really, um, really push us to look to Central Corridor as, as the last uh, battleground, I suppose, for coming up with tools that address displacement. You know, there are neighborhoods in Soma already that exist, and so through Central Quarter, can we do more than just up zone for more office, up zone for more housing, but can we really think about tools for displacement or tools for relocation or, you know, whatever it happens to be that, that will help protect the people that already live there? Um, I think that, that adds a, a race and a class element to thinking about increased growth, that it's not just it's not just growth for growth's sake, but who gets to live there, who gets these jobs. I think that after Central Corridor, much of the project of the I mean, much of the work of the planning department is going to be big projects. 
Um, so you can see might be an example of that. I think going forward, it's going to be projects like Pier 7G, um, maybe projects, um, it's not clear what's going to happen there yet, but the UCSF site in, in Laurel Heights. So it's going to be about these large project areas. And so can we, you know, what are the tools that we have to fight displacement or get the right kind of community benefits out of those projects? And I think we may want to look at CPMC as a model of how to how to build coalitions, how to make sure that all the asks on the, are on the table and, and <coughs> stick together on those asks um, of affordable housing, of jobs, of infrastructure, of um, open space, of all of that, to make sure that the growth doesn't just add to displacement pressure, but also creates and adds to the neighborhood that exists. Thanks, Amy. Uh, do you want to pick up from there and talk about displacement as it says, uh, existing communities? Yeah. Can everybody hear me? Hi, hi everybody. My name is Maria. I'm the San Francisco Housing Rights Organizer for Causa Justicia Just Cause, um, and we are a housing rights uh, and immigrant justice organization here in the Bay Area. Um, I wanna, I wanna, I wanna tell you all about um, a member that I helped out, one of our clients, and a member that I helped out a couple months ago. So her name is also Maria. Her, um, she lives at 23rd and Folsom, and about two months ago, she took her one-year-old to get a shot. Um, and she was coming back home because she was tired. Um, her baby had just gotten his shots, and she was really looking forward to um, just resting. When she got home, she found that her landlord had locked her out of her unit, um, and she couldn't get in. She was already a client with us, so she knew that you know she could come to the office and we would help her with her lockout. Um, so this is the same landlord that had illegally evicted her husband not too far, uh, a couple months back. Um, and so there had been various amounts of kind of abuses of, of, of her and, um, and her tenancy. So after a while, we were able to get her back in her unit. Um, and when, when we were able to get back in her unit, the conditions of where she lived were actually really, um, like really took me off guard. So she lives in a legally constructed room on the back of the apartment building. The room is so tiny that her full-size mattress touches three out of the four walls in the unit and takes up at least half of the whole room. Um, there, there is mold, there are leaks, um, there is lead in the property that has made its way into her baby's bloodstream. There is no insulation or heat. Um, and she pays $550 for this unit, which is more than half of her monthly income. Right? And so I, I talk about this um, because while we, while, um, because this is what planning processes that facilitate and aggravate displacement are going to do, right? They're going to push our folks out of the city, of course, and maybe even out of the region. Um, but they're also going to push our communities further and further into inhabitable housing, right? So that's the other, the other question about displacement. We're not always displaced out of our, out of our cities. Sometimes we're just displaced out of habitable, safe housing into housing that isn't habitable or safe and makes us sick and makes our loved ones sick. Um, so Maria was able to, and she's still fighting for that house, right? Like even if it's not the best place for her to live, she still is fighting for it and is and wants to keep it. And we're going to help her do it. And 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 the thing is that because she has community and because she knows where in her neighborhood she can get legal resources, she is able to fight for her housing. Um, now imagine if she didn't know where those things were, if she didn't live in a community where she had friends and family around or where there was easily accessible legal support services like ours. And that's kind of where, that's what our, our Causa Justa's um, methods or, method, or methodology for organizing is really an important intervention in being able to fight gentrification and displacement, right? So we, we work on, on, a, on a couple different levels. Um, we provide support, provide support for tenants um, and homeowners and fighting for their housing. Um, we also work on policy campaigns um, and engage in the electoral process with door-to-door -door civic engagement um, outreach. We also do really intentional leadership development and member development that centralizes the needs and opinions of the most impacted residents in whatever fight we were taking a part of. And we think that this approach has the, and we think this is an approach that can be taken to planning as well, right? And planning for communities and planning for neighborhoods and planning for regions and cities. Because this, this approach has the ability to impact not only outcomes, but also the process, which is, is equally important um, 
Advocacy we know can only, only has the potential to impact the outcome, but it is much rarer that it can also impact process and change process. Um, so that's the intervention, that base building, organized, grassroots organizing, like, like the kind we do at my organization, is able to provide. It can dynamically change impact, and it can also dynamically change process. Um, so I want to I wanna give an example of a way in which um, we were able to dynamically also change process. So um, how many of you all have heard of the Mission Anti-Displacement Coalition? Yeah, so the Mission Anti-Displacement Coalition was a 10-year um, movement in the mission to fight displacement um, that, um, and, and went above and beyond just, just planning, right? So there were a lot of, of ways in which mission residents fought for their homes and fought for their neighborhoods. Um, so that means that they directed direct action to protect their homes, to protect land, to protect um, centers of community and cultural importance in the neighborhood. Um, they also had regular community forums to respond to a city hall developed plan called the Eastern Neighborhoods Plan um, and developed a community-based alternative plan for their neighborhoods, the People's Plan. So for 10 years, folks were mobilizing and organizing um, to individually to, to protect their own homes, but also on a, re, on a citywide level. They said, we're being told that this Eastern Neighborhoods Plan is what our, what our neighborhood is gonna look like. We see that it's gonna cause displacement, it's gonna cause um, job loss, you know, working class blue collar jobs are no longer gonna be part of the city, and we don't like that. So we're gonna take a part in this conversation, and we're gonna be involved for 10 years, and at the end of that, we're, gonna, we're going to also have our own alternative plan. Um, so that, that's one way, that's one example of folks being engaged and committed, and that changed process, right? Folks are, folks are able to be more involved now, um, and, it, and it had some impacts and outcome as well. Um, when folks aren't involved, what we see is the type of displacement we've been seeing in planning processes, you know, for, for, for the decades we've been here. Um, we see urban renewal in San Francisco in the 60s that bulldozed blocks and blocks of the Western Edition and stole and destroyed black San Franciscans homes and businesses um, and displaced them from the city for generations sometimes. Um, this was a planning decision about the kind of neighborhood San Francisco was gonna be that did not have input from the community that was already there. Um, and the impact that that had is that now the black population in San Francisco is at 6%. Um, and this, this population decrease is something that we're also seeing in the mission. In the, according to 2010 census data, um, the mission Latino, the Latino population of the mission fell at 22%. Um, so that, <laughs> that's what happens, right? When planning decisions get made, when decisions about what type of housing goes where, what type of jobs are gonna be prioritized. Um, because I think something that's really important to talk about planning and planning processes is that it's about priorities. What, how are we prioritizing and what kind of development, development are we prioritizing in our neighborhoods? And that has an impact on who gets to live there. That has an impact on whether San Francisco's black population is only 6% or if there's a 22% drop in, a, in, a, in the mission's um, Latino population. So after decades you know, of trickle down regional planning, we need, to start we need to start changing that planning process, right? Yes. Yeah. Um, and that means that we need a planning process that comes from the ground up, um, at, you know, or minimally. <laughs> if that, if, you know, that's too much for folks. Um, we hope it's not. But minimally, that ensures that a process is able to have some level of dynamic engagement by the folks that live in the areas that are going to be impacted by these decisions. Um, and then that way, you can you can impact outcome. You can impact what the priorities are, what kind of development is going to look like, whose housing is, is going to be saved and whose housing is going to be um, prioritized, as well as change the way in which we make that planning process happen, as well as change the process, engage folks, right? Because we don't just want, we don't just want a change, we also need to be a part of it. Our opinions and our needs and our leadership needs to be a part of those conversations as well. Um, and so, that's, that's kind of the, the intervention that grassroots organizing is able to provide. It's able to, to centralize and um, really focus on the needs of, of um, working class communities of color, uh, 
by changing process and outcome. Thank you, Maria. Mike, do you want to talk about labor's perspective? Um, okay. So, I guess um, from organized labor's perspective, uh, big, well, the obvious question is what kind of jobs? Um, but just as important is where do we live? And um, when we talk about what kind of jobs are being created, um, certainly the jobs that go into the development of self building um, are unfortunately increasingly not as many union jobs as people would um, make it out to be. Increasingly, I've been talking to a couple of building trades uh, folks over the last couple of days, and um, more of the development is increasingly um, not union. You're seeing that as well, um, big time, like in Manhattan. Nobody would have thought 30 years ago that um, most of the development in Manhattan is non-union, right? I mean, it's just unheard of. Um, but while oftentimes building trades do, do get their project labor agreements and uh, those jobs are union, it's the jobs that come afterwards, the jobs that our members hold in the hotels or uh, in food service and uh, or uh, maintenance, janitorial, retail, those are all lower wage jobs. And um, it's funny because People think, well, naturally they're lower wage jobs, but why should they be lower wage jobs? Um, I mean, back in the 20s, people thought about workers on the docks. Well, of course, they're lower wage jobs. There weren't lower wage jobs in the 30s and the 40s and the 50s and the 60s because the labor movement took hold. There was a strike. There were a series of strikes, and um, economic uh, economic justice was much more of a priority in this and other cities. Um, unfortunately, I think that we've become very much alienated and marginalized from each other. I think that um, the big problem in many ways is um, how do we attain the unity that's required for us to do what we need to do. Um, not everybody necessarily agrees that a stronger labor movement is a cornerstone of a more progressive uh, environment in which we live. Um, and the reason is, I think, first we need to look at ourselves, that is the labor movement. Why is that? What have we done that has alienated so many uh, otherwise progressive folks? Um, you know, because we just keep on getting further and further apart. Um, the thing that most concerns me you know, right down to where Local 2 lives, is we have approximately 50 to 60% of our members living right here in San Francisco. Um, increasingly, though, we're seeing people being displaced. Not just trying to think of, think ahead. I, I will be retired by then, but, you know, 15, 20 years down the road, and suddenly that 50% or 60% drops to 35% and then 30% and 20%. How are we going to put 1,000 people on the streets for a contract fight? How are we going to put you know, 500 people in support of another campaign, whatever it happens to be, when people have to get home you know, uh, to uh, take care of their families and they've got to fly or they've got to drive or take public transit or all the way to uh, Vallejo, they're not going to get home as it is after work until you know uh, six, seven o'clock. He added on another demonstration. It's going to be even longer. And so suddenly, the demographics of the city shapes very much what the uh, what the politics of protest look like. Because increasingly, working class people are not going to be living in the city. Um, we we are unfortunately you know, quite divided on this. Not just within the labor movement, but we are divided, you know, as the greater progressive movement. Um, the uh, advent of jobs to justice has been just, I think, probably one of the best things that happened has happened to the labor movement in decades, because what it does is it really brings community organizations and unions uh, together to work. However, there's been a backlash, and the backlash is called the Alliance for Jobs and Sustainable Growth, um, which I find, you know, to be an incredibly, really 
not a you are part of that, I guess. <laughs> um, the, uh, the Alliance for Jobs and Sustainable Growth is one of the most sinister um, reactions that I've seen in you know the 30 years that I've been in the labor movement. It's nothing more, really, than a front for the Chamber of Commerce. Right. And right. we have, unfortunately, um, a number of unions have joined and participated in that. And it would be easy for us to marginalize and demonize them, but why did that happen? Because they have felt excluded. Those unions that have joined, you know, I'll give an example, the uh, Longshoremen's Union, Local 6, the Warehouseman's Union. I was shocked to hear they have less than 10 members left employed in this city. That's pretty, the Longshoremen, uh, the warehouse division of the Longshoremen's Union, right? I mean, one of the cornerstones of, you know, uh, the movement that, you know, brought about so much social and economic change in this city. Um, the uh, problem is that, I mean, they're one of the more progressive unions. You think about progressive unions, cutting edge. They're in the Alliance for Jobs and Sustainable Growth. Progressive leadership, why? Because they don't see any other alternatives um, in terms of people creating jobs and working together to build jobs. And I'm very much concerned about that. And I think what we really, unfortunately, need to focus on is how do we learn how to disagree with each other? You know, that's the hardest thing um, within the movement. And so how do we, you know, recognize that from time to time we're going to be on different sides of, you know, an issue, and then, you know, down the road still be able to work together? We do not have the luxury of time to let 20, I, look, I'm Irish and a trade unionist, which means that I never forget anything. <laughs> That's unfortunately how the labor movement is. We never forget an injustice, whether it was done by the boss or done by a sister or brother in the movement. And um, we don't have the luxury of waiting for time, you know, 20 years or 15 years to forget those things. And I, I'm, I'm concerned that we haven't learned as a movement, and again, when I'm talking about the labor movement, I'm not just talking about the labor movement, because the labor movement doesn't have anywhere near the power to make the social and economic change that we all have a vision to achieve without the community working hand in glove with us and us with them. And so those are the concerns that I have. You know, it's just like we need to think about how do we pull in the building trades. And when we're not together with the trades, how do we learn, you know, to move beyond that and work together? Um, you know, the the problem that we also have is we uh, I agree with CPMC being you know a great model to look for, but we need to get way out in front of these projects. You know, the building trades already have a project labor agreement, I believe, or are close to getting one with the new Giants development. Right now, I'm particularly focused on the Giants because uh, our members are without a contract and have been three years during which the Giants won two World Series. Their profits are up incredibly. The value of the team's up 40%, and our members have had wage freezes for three years. And this is the corporation that is talking about developing a whole new neighborhood just south of the ballpark. Well. What are going to be the community benefits? What are going to be the housing, you know, uh, requirements for uh, affordable housing and that? Those are issues that we're most concerned about. And how do we work together and get out in front of this and actually make the next CPMC being a project like that? So that's all I got to say. Thank you. You know, we may not all agree on everything and every project and every deal, but I think everybody in this room agrees that this is our city, right? Yeah. This is our city and somebody should not come in and tell us what to do with it, right? So that's what we're about here. Um, last and certainly not least, Bob Allen, Urban Habitat has been working from day one on Glen Bay area, has worked really hard to put together the alternative, the uh, justice and equity alternative that we all agree is better than what ABAG wants to do. Um, still doesn't solve all the problems, but it's certainly better. And I want to turn it over to him for the last of our panelists.
Okay, thanks, Tim. I want to thank Chuchu and the folks who organized the event and the Guardian for the coverage of what is certainly uh, a sometimes very obscure issue. I'm curious, before you read the article or heard about the event, how many people had ever heard of NPC or ABAG before? You can't ask these questions in San Francisco. <laughs> you know all the acronyms, you, you know it's, it's a waste. You gotta know, throw it all away. All right. Marcy Ryan, my colleague who does a lot of communications work with us, um, always talks about this being the biggest thing that no one knows about. And I think, you know, Gen made the case very persuasively, and some of the other panelists, why we should care and we should know about it. Um, some things I would add to it is, you know, the Department of Housing and Urban Development is actually looking at the whole structure of the party development area, um, planning process, violating civil rights. The state's Office of Housing and Community Development has some serious problems with the legality of it. If you have questions about that, my colleague Sam is in the back of public advocacy. He'll raise his hand after he smirks me. <laughs> and he's an expert on the civil rights side of this, so if you have questions about that. But there's a lot of attention being paid to the legality of this, but I want to go back to what Maria talked about a minute ago, and I want to talk about something that we often don't talk about in public with each other, and I think a few years ago I remember getting that party development area map that folks uh, put up on the wall there, and looking at that intersecting with that terrible term NPC uses called communities of concern. They have no sense of irony when they come up with these phrases. <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing. Um, and when they did, I remember going to Malcolm Young, and I was Malcolm Sheriff, and then later again, and Cindy and folks, and saying, look at this. <coughs> you know, we all knew as soon as that map came out, and Malcolm was saying to me, geez, you know, how did they come up with this? And to back to Maria's point, I think, is one of the reasons they came up with it is that we need to say that in the funding for this work, not enough goes to the organizing work. And, you know, organizing, that's important. It's important that we call the funders who, to be quite honest, fund groups like mine and other groups you know, that do this work, but don't sufficiently fund the grassroots organizing groups. And I think that's an important part of this whole conversation. And Mike's point about a movement, that work has to be funded and has to be supported. And all of us, both on the inside and outside, have to do a better job because that's one of the ways that these things won't creep, quote unquote, creep up on us or come out of the blue. Is if the group's doing the most important work on the ground, and I know Sam and our allies agree with this. Sorry, someone. Hold back. Okay. If so you I can silence it's... your cell phones, that would be really good. You've only had one instance tonight, that's pretty good. Okay. So, so just to start with that, that's one of the reasons that folks are not, it's not about paying attention, it's about being funded so that the grassroots organizing work drives what happens at the regional level. So that has to change in order for this to work. And we, I think we've had some success with our kind of formation of the six wings for social equity, but that is very limited still when you look at the big picture geographically and you know in getting San Francisco to have a robust presence. We've had some great participation from Just Cause, Choo Choo, a number of the groups, CCDC, folks in the room. But to get a real movement together, that work has to be funded and has to be connected up to the regional piece. So I think we need to start with that, um, that framework. And I think we can go from there. You know, it's a push to get unaccountable, undemocratic, unrepresented institutions like NTC and ABAG. It's a push to get people to pay attention to those. I'll let the folks work with the planning department comment on that. Um, I'll that one. But it's a real push. And there are better models. In Portland, the metro uh, region model they have, not perfect. But they do exercise some influence over what's called local control. And that, that phrase, local control, it's a really interesting one. Uh, there's a scholar at, at Berkeley, John Powell, and people have read him, talks about local control being the next iteration in civil rights. And it really we went from states' rights and Jim Crow to local control. Local control is a way to say, I don't want black and brown people to live in my suburban community. It's a way to say, I want them to come and take all the low-wage jobs, but I don't want them to come and live in my community. And public advocates, we were fortunate to be a plaintiff on a suit that they worked on to open up the city of Pleasanton to zone and eventually build affordable housing. And a big connection to that was around the climate issue, but really it's about you know, the modern face of segregation. The reason I bring that up is there's a direct relationship, and I think Dan framed it really accurately. You know, we could, and I did, I was at question time yesterday, and we can make our own comments about the mayor's characterization of 
the strength of our anti-displacement policies in the city. But the truth is, for the 25% of Oakland's resident, the black population that was displaced between 20, 2000 and 2010, that's 33,000 African American folks driven out of Oakland in that decade, driven to places that don't have any of the protections. So one of the things we tried to look at conceptually was saying, if we've got a whole generation of people already been displaced. Forget the people who are you know, the target of these planning processes and the kind of larger market forces. We've already got people out in these communities with bad transit, with foreclosed you know, track housing. What are we going to do from them? And how are we going to deal with this relationship? And one of the ways we dealt with this is that don't put all the growth in San Francisco, San Jose, and Oakland. You know, break down those walls of de facto segregation. You know, open up what we call um, priority development light places. So the way these PDAs work, just so you know, people get to voluntarily designate what a PDA is. The opposite end of that is, I want to voluntarily keep my de facto segregation in place. Right? I don't want to designate as a PDA, and I don't want to take on more growth. That's what's happened. So our fight to not have hyper, hyper um, concentration of increased units, the other side of that is the suburbanization of poverty. People have seen the census. Poverty is increasingly becoming, as we know, as people are pushed out of San Francisco and Oakland, or black and brown people are pushed into suburbs. So we got to deal with that. And we have to deal with that as a movement. And we, you know, I, I live in San Francisco. We don't think we're exceptional. We know we're exceptional. But that San Francisco exceptionalism is a problem if we don't look to build a movement. And that doesn't mean everyone has to start doing regional planning work. But it does mean, please, I, I like most of the people in this room. I wouldn't want to put that on you as a daily job. Again, we'll attest to that. But we have to have a bigger conception of what we are as a region, what, what's already happened historically. And we have to have an honest conversation about the limits of planning in the face of pro-market development policies and a bigger neoliberal kind of agenda that the country is going in and already gone. We, we're in that context. That's what we're facing. So we can do a better job with these plans. But I don't think we should you know, also delude ourselves into thinking it goes back to, I think, as Maria framed it. It takes a movement, it takes organizing, and that, that is the most important part. So really quickly, because I want to get to questions, we did come up with a plan with not, I think, a sufficient and as broad-based input from all the community groups we would love to have, but, but driven a lot, I think, to, to be fair, about community needs. Putting $3 billion more into transit operations funding to restore bus cuts in particular systems that serve low-income people, people of color. Conditioning funding, because we can't get at local control. Conditioning block grant funding that MDC has to say you've got to start adopting displacement and anti-gentrification policies where you don't have them. And we haven't been as successful at that. Um, I'll talk about the staff report that just came out. There's some good things in there, like more money for transit operations to go to the people who need and rely on transit, transit dependent folks, as Cindy said, and not to build stuff for quote unquote choice riders. But we do have limits on what we can do. But we can push not to have, what's the number, so that windows, 95% of the growth in 15 cities as the preferred alternative has. But even dialing it back to 80% or something lower means that job rich places with good schools, suburban communities have to take on more growth. And it will dial down the pressure in San Francisco. We'll not relieve it completely. We know that. But we've got to do something. And I think the plan we put forward is a start pushing staff and especially suburban commissioners. Just to give you an idea, Napa has one vote on the 16, is it 16 members still? Am I losing my math? Member MTC body? Yep. Seven. Seven. Got two more votes. Napa has one vote. San Francisco has how many? Three. Three. Two. 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 San Jose now has an increased vote up to three in the counties of Santa Clara, and so is Alameda in the city of Oakland. But that gives you a sense of Napa has one vote. The northern Suburban counties can form a de facto block to keep people out, to keep growth out. Marin can draw a wall up and say, you're part of Agenda 21. If you don't know what Agenda 21 is, Google, watch the, watch the Simpsons-like video of what Agenda 21 is. The secret plot for us to not allow de facto segregation to happen throughout the Bay Area. Marin can draw a wall up and say, we're not going to take any more growth. That's the limits to the regional governments institutions we have in the Bay Area. So that reforming those and fixing those is a much bigger, bigger political project that you know, I'd be happy to talk about. But the coalition we have, we did a really great advocacy day yesterday. I think we got the word out about more transit funding, 
especially for local service, serving transit, doing something about conditioning block grant money to open up suburban communities and these PDA-like places, and you know, putting more housing growth throughout the Bay Area. So those are the big planks of this scenario you heard referred to as equity environment jobs. You know, it still gets our, our uh, percentage of renters already <coughs> burdened renters at risk for high displacement down to I think 21 or 22 percent. That's not acceptable. One out of five people, and that's across the Bay Area. You start to drill down, look in different you know cities and in different regions, it's a much higher number. So you know, it is not the solution. But to get to Maria's point about what community-driven planning process like, it's a step. Not a sufficient one, but I think a step in the right direction. San Francisco has to lead if we're going to have a plan the next time that really reflects, you know, the priorities of people who are most impacted in that. And I think, you know, events like this tonight are a good start. And I hope that the conversation we can have going forward, we can talk about what that movement looks like and how, again, we can have a sense of, you know, it's not about just San Francisco because folks have already been pushed out. People are going to be pushed out more. It's about what kind of movement building strategy we can have to really have a community-led process that starts with needs of people and not with political trade-offs and how we can just get more funding for my pet project, because that's how things work if you haven't been subjected to an MTC meeting. Thank okay. you, I'm, gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm not trying to cut you off, but I want to leave plenty of time back to me. Are you kind of close to the end? I'm done. Outstanding, <laughs> perfect timing. I do want to, uh, Take one quick second and recognize Supervisor Eric Marr, who's in the back, who is, who is the person who asked the question about displacement that led the mayor to say that we have the best displacement and displacement tools in the country, which any renter in San Francisco would shake their head and say, as I think one of the panelists said, well, then we're in very serious trouble. But that's the best we can do. This is a two-way conversation, a multi-way conversation. This is not all about us. We want ideas, thoughts, questions from the audience. What I'm going to try to do to get more people in is I'm going to try to ask you to just stand up and talk loud so we don't have to all line up in a mic. If that doesn't work, we have a roving mic we can use. That just takes a little more time. Yeah, okay, you, yes, I know. You can go first. Yes. Okay. legislation, that would be a very good thing. Um, the People's Plan uh, was indeed a very good plan. However, what was accepted was the Eastern Neighborhoods Plan. The Eastern Neighborhoods Plan, uh, in turn, can be very easily ignored. All it has to do is a developer comes in with exceptions, exemptions, and uh, variances, and the plan uh, goes by the wayside. So, uh, Judy, can we kind of, I want to give everybody a chance yes, to talk, so, just, okay. I was making, I just want to make four points based on... Right, no, I'm, I'm, I'm going to try not to cut people off, but I'm going to try to keep it moving, so that, because there's a lot of people here who have a lot of things to say, and I want to hear from all of you. Yeah, Mike, uh, no, uh, right, you go, and then Tony, Hi. back. Hi, Terrence Faulkner, uh, I'm a county senator from anyone. I was also, in 1974, elected uh, to the, to the regional, regional growth board uh, ABEG. Uh, I was one of the citizen input ones. I had a chance to see ABEG in its early stages. It represents the people of the Bay Area, like the old time British House of Lords uh, represented in the people. Uh, basically, you have a pack of city councilmen who get elected from different areas, 
most of them are just there to get their little sinecure for $100 a night, whatever. Um, and it's run by staff. The staff, in turn, is paid about twice as much as the people in city government. Uh, they're heavily subject to pressures from Sacramento and lobbyists, and they represent virtually nobody. Um, ABAG is a unique critter by itself. Go to a couple of their meetings and you'll get the idea. Um, Judy, Judy Berkowitz said it about right. The best way to handle block bar, it, oh, ABAG is, when necessary, step on them and tell them no. Thank you, Terrence. <laughs> Tony. Uh, Tony Kelly, I'm trying to keep this to two minutes. Uh, I think it's important to say that this is not, in terms of San Francisco and what the planning department has already done in the past five years, this is not a, two, a 2040 problem, not a planning problem. It's here today, right now. If you actually go to the planning department website, and really, why would you? But if you did, <laughs> there's more than 20 approved area plans in the last five or six years. You add up the number of housing units entitled in those area plans in the large of the eastern half of the city, almost all the eastern half of the city, it's about 85,000 housing units. And that number you saw on the screen was 92,000 housing units needed by 2040. These are plans that are already on the books today. So, either this 92,000 housing unit goal is doubling what's already on the books, which means that a bag is twice as insane as you already think they might be, or it's actually plans that are already approved now, which changes, I think, what, what our conversation is because it means that there's already that amount of planning going on. It means that in terms of this plan, there's no need for a plan barrier response to be more carnivorous on CEQA. There's no reason for it to be more carnivorous on more neighborhoods. We already know which neighborhoods are at risk. They're the ones that already have area plans adopted now, and they have dire, dire infrastructure needs. So we need emergency measures yesterday in terms of infrastructure support, in those areas, in terms of foreclosure remedies in these areas, unsafe housing remedies in these areas, and stronger project review with an eye toward cloud housing justice. Because the planning process is already done. That horse has left the barn. It's the project review in those areas that we need to get tougher on, and we need those measures right now. Thanks, Tony. And just um, to, to amplify what he said, as I said earlier in my introductory remarks, a lot of these fights are not going to happen in ABAG. A lot of this is going to happen right here in San Francisco over questions like, okay, we've approved all of this, but where's the affordable housing? And there is no money anywhere for the infrastructure that's needed for all of these, these new residents. Uh, yeah. My name is William Walker. I'm a former student trustee at City College, but I'm a, one of the newest displaced residents of San Francisco. It's bittersweet because I'm actually going to planning school at Cal Poly. But um, I've been reading these plans since I was a kid, and the numbers are based upon uh, the projections that each municipality wants to bring to the table. So I, I really think that NTC and ABAG should really look at when cities like San Francisco take on the brunt, that when a city like Dublin wants a BART extension where they have a bus system there where more people ride the 54 Felton. I don't know if you guys know the 54 Felton, the really horrible line on the southeast side of the city. There are more people on that bus line than on the whole bus system that serves Dublin and Livermore. But they want a specialized BART extension to serve their community. And it's at the detriment of corridors like Van Ness. The Van Ness corridor carries twice the amount of ridership as the bus services that serve Marin, which is what we're pushing through on BRT in addition to our services are all the buses on that bus. So it's important that we hold these smaller communities accountable that if they want sexy projects for their transportation mobility, that they should also be taking on the development. And it's something that should be discussed at MTC and ABAC. And as far as locally, when you look at the AMI for the new jobs that are being created, we talk about all the affordable housing in San Francisco. But if all those jobs are below the 50% AMI, the vast majority of the affordable housing that's being created here is at higher than the 50% AMI. So we're not serving the people that need that housing the most. So it's important to consider those two things. Thanks a lot. I noticed that um, all the uh, MTC and ABAC meetings are in Oakland. Why? And also, I, I wanted to say the developers don't actually have to build affordable housing. They can pay into a fund. I'm not exactly sure where that money goes. I, I want to know where that money goes and what, what's done with it and how we can stop them from actually having to pay money to get out of building affordable housing. Right? 
It's well, it's a big, it's a, it's a good question. Peter, do you want to uh, respond to that? Uh, I'm just calling on Peter Cohen from Council of Community Housing Organizations. You can answer that. You got to repeat it quickly. Sorry. Where does the money, when a developer decides that they don't want to build affordable housing, they just want to pay into a fund? Mm -hmm. What happens with that money? It has, it goes into it what's called the citywide that. affordable housing fund. Uh, that is used to support affordable housing projects throughout the city. It's not in any particular neighborhood. So if the market rate development is on the waterfront, that funding could go to a project in the Tenderloin, it could go into the Bayview, it could go to any part of the city. And that's uh, one of the primary sources of, of leveraging affordable housing in San Francisco. Her question was, how can, how can we stop, stop that? Yeah, I mean, you know, obviously the developers who are building $10 million condos, they don't want poor people living there, yeah. too. Um, well, so that, that is a compromise that the city made. Yeah, and so our, our organization actually, because you know, affordable housing money and the in in loop fees, if you will, which should be a good thing from an affordable housing developer standpoint, it's cash, right? But we felt from a policy standpoint, we would we advocate for mixed income housing. We'd rather see that go into the projects and get on site mixed housing with some affordable units. And we've been a primary proponent of that, even if it means there's less money that goes. 100% affordable, we think in the long term are serving a broader range of folks. We tried to incentivize that through Prop C. If folks remember, there was a slight reduction to do on-site. Unfortunately, what we're finding is developers still find it profitable to simply write the city a check because the loss opportunity cost on those 10 or 15 units is still much greater to do them on-site than to write the city a $5 million check and do 100% market rate. So how to get them to do it on site is, is, a, is still a question. Just one yes, you wanted to Please, panelists, jump in. All right. I, mean, this, I want this to be a free flow of conversation. Jump in if you have something to say. Yeah. Just, just respond to the question about why the meetings are at night. It's because more people don't show up during the day. It's because more people don't show up and say you need to have them at night. It's why they were in Oakland. No, it's why they were in Oakland. And, and, and Oakland. They're it's all because, in Oakland. Yeah. <laughs> Believe me, I'm very aware of that. I, I, unfortunately, I've got way too many. Because people don't show up and make them rotate their meetings. They'll have the final vote in July in the evening. They'll still be in Oakland. But this might make you feel better. MTC wants to spend about $200 million in bridge toll funds to move over to San Francisco. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know how you feel about that. People are, some people are working. Is that plan have to go to the state legislature? On the affordable housing. So I don't displace anybody. So I think it's actually kind of nuanced, this question about whether or not you want on-site affordable housing units. So, and it all has to do with who gets to live in those units. So if it's an ownership building and the BMR, the below market rate units are on site, you can make up to 120% of the AMI and still qualify. So to me, that means you're actually kind of middle income. But then if your money goes into the Luffy and it goes into the pot that then gets spread out through the city, often those funds are going to projects that serve a much lower AMI. So I think we often want to see on-site units because I think we want neighborhoods that are associated economically diverse. But I think that there's there's an upside also for the money to be paid in lieu to uh, to go to projects where maybe you're serving someone more at the 60% AMI level. I didn't actually yeah, mean right on-site units. I meant right, to right. actually build a building somewhere else. It's a good idea. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I'm a little concerned that statement was made that all the panelists are prone to growth. Um, I don't really understand why, why we have to buy into that capitalist notion. Um, if people are coming from Ohio to come to San Francisco, that's one thing. And I don't know why we want that to happen. Like, it seems like we should want communities to stay, like, more in line with where they are, and not just this influx of people to San Francisco, which is a big symptom of these dot-com booms, right? Is that these companies like Twitter they now have office space in San Francisco, but they're not necessarily hiring San Franciscans. Um, and obviously there's now the issue of the reverse commuter, where we have all these Google and Genentech and Apple buses that allow people who would otherwise be safely tucked in Cupertino and Mountain View, now living in their brand new, newly built condos in San Francisco that they are able to buy with their mega million dollar salaries. Um, and also, you know, I read in The, the Guardian, the, this is a great article, by the way. Thank you so much for including it. Um, but that things like commercial rent control are banned by the state. Um, vacated housing is not allowed to be rent controlled. And it seems weird because um, the vacated housing uh, rent control, that happens in New York City. And that seems to be 
like a less tenant friendly place. So the fact that that doesn't happen here is really shocking to me and um, atrocious. But what wasn't mentioned in the article was the fact that rent control is only allowed for certain age buildings in San Francisco. And so literally all of the new development, even if it were going to be like rentable, because let's, let's face it, I mean, even if you're low income, if, if, even if there's affordable, viable housing, low income people aren't buying it, you know? Um, we're renters. Um, and we're going to be renters, and there shouldn't be this plan that, oh, we're all going to buy someday, because that's not realistic. Um, and so, um, you know, what can we do about this law in San Francisco that we can only rent control, you know, the buildings that are old that probably need higher rents anyway, and make all the development condos instead of Thanks. rents? Yeah, so, so, let me respond to, yeah, like respond, respond to two things. I think that uh, the, 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 first off, the, the restriction on rent control is state law. And that's one of the, the reasons why Tim has, has emphasized, I think, quite correctly, that we need to press the state to give us the ability to protect our affordable housing. Um, and that needs to be high on our list. Um, they are demanding that we do this growth, and so if that's the case, we need protections. With respect to the question about growth, I wasn't saying that we have to have growth, I'm just saying we're not anti-growth. Sometimes the, 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 and this has been raised also with respect to density, um, I think that, um, likewise, I don't think we're necessarily opposed to more density. The fact that we, maybe it is a more environmental path to have more density in San Francisco and certain other areas. That's something we should talk about whether we can do it equitably. What I'm not saying necessarily we have to grow, so just to be fair. But I think the conversation about growth for San Francisco is something we really, we have to have more conversation. I mean, because growth does mean jobs, right? And we do want jobs. What kind of jobs? How do we get there? Um, but we don't want to, I, I think the, we're opposed, the, the, the kind of dichotomy that was presented in the mayor's response yesterday is problematic, right? Saying, look, you're criticizing displacement, but I'm creating jobs, right? And we need to address the jobs question and and housing, right? They, they shouldn't be put opposed against each other. That's the, that's the, future panel discussion that we're going to have. And I'd like to respond to that as well. Um, so I think, I think, yes, saying that we're all pro-growth is, I think, a very complicated statement. I would say that as someone that works with working class communities, I'm pro-community-based development, right? I think there's these myths that go around that our communities either don't want development, we want our communities and our neighborhoods to stay exactly the way that they are, don't, you know, or that we'll take whatever development comes our way. If you tell us you're going to put a bus line through our community, then we'll take it. If, if you tell us you're going to do this other thing, then we'll take it, right? And I think that both of those myths are wrong. We want better neighborhoods. <laughs> we want more pedestrian safety. We want more and better affordable housing. We want better schools. There's a lot of things that communities want. That the, A lot of those things are development. The, thing, the, 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 the way in which they don't buy into a capitalist notion of growth or what development means is because they're not, they wouldn't be for profit, right? They would be for and centered on the community. Community would have a, a, a level of buy-in and a level of direction for what, what that development would look like. And it would be centralized on the needs that community members in, in those neighborhoods and in those regions and in those cities would themselves identify. Right, so that's a really different way of planning and doing growth and doing development because it's not for it's not for profit. Nobody's going to make any money off of it. It's to actually make a neighborhood and a community better for the people that exist and live there. Um, and then to go back to your to so that was one thing that you said. The other thing that you said was um, was, was this question about rent control. So um, yes, uh, there are statewide restrictions on rent control. So. Um, Rent control gets to be, only local cities get to decide whether your, your, your city or your, your, your municipality or your county is going to have rent control or eviction protections, right? Because if you, don't, if you have rent control and you don't have eviction protections, or if you have eviction protections and you don't have rent control, then uh, it's, it's, you're, not, you're not actually being effective. You need both. Um, and the, the, the reason why we don't have it on a, state, on, on a statewide level or why um, only buildings before 1979 are the ones that I have rent control in here in San Francisco is because um, there hasn't been a robust, we don't have a robust tenant movement in California. We could push our legislators on a statewide level to move things. We could push our legislators here in, in, in San Francisco to move things. 
But we need to build that movement. We need to do grassroots organizing. We need to be we need to be moving and building power in our communities and our neighborhoods, or else we're gonna you know things are gonna stay the same. Um, Thanks. Yeah. Thanks so much. Yeah. Everybody, I'm Brian Basinger, the director of the East Housing Alliance here in San Francisco. And I'm, a, I'm much more of a get to the solutions guy and not like to find the problem so much. Otherwise, I think if we don't spend time on solutions, people get, uh, the energy gets raised and then dissipated. Mm -hmm. right? um, and so we have been talking with some of our elected officials about the possibility they are open to carrying legislation in Sacramento to deal with the LSAC. And if we're, I don't think that we should uh, give up and say that it's a fait accompli, that it's impossible. I think we have a unique opportunity, especially if we can get labor support with uh, some very strong um, labor leaders in Sacramento to help um, move the legislation. We've got people willing to carry it, and we've got a strategy about local control that we think might cross the aisle. Um, and so I think that our elected officials are just waiting to see if the community is behind it and if this is something that we want to push them to support and to really create the grassroots movement to, to move it forward. And so we could move this as early as January. It's just as if everybody's behind it or not. So you know, that's one thing for us to think about as an outcome for today's meeting. Absolutely. It's, it's very important because the, thing, the, the argument and the reason that we have a unique opportunity here and now to take on some of these issues is we have this Glen Bay area. We have the state legislature saying to us, you have to do this. And at the same time, taking away the tools we need to protect existing communities. So you go to the state legislature and say, okay, we're down with this. You want us to do SB 375, we'll do it. But give us back rent controls and vacant apartments. Get rid of the Ellis Act. Give us the right to do commercial rent control if we want to in our communities. And fine, then we can do this. So there is that opportunity, and I know that there are people talking about it, and that will be a tough, tough statewide battle, but it's important. Yeah, Mark. Hey. Thank you. Yeah, Mike Casey really gets it right here. Um, we have failed as a movement, as progressives, as nonprofits, and as, for, as folks to connect with our communities. And that's why we're not seeing the traction. That's why we've lost elections, we've lost government. Right? It was um, 10 years ago we were winning elections. We didn't make asks, we made demands, and we got them. We're not doing that right now, and there are reasons why we have to have an introspective process to figure out how we fail and what the path is to success. We also tried on participatory planning in the Western Soma, and as we move forward with some pretty progressive anti-displacement tools, the nonprofits and, and people getting city money were called upon, their chains were yanked, and those things were taken out of the plan. Um, in the neoliberal context, nonprofits will not get funded to contest the imperatives of capital by independent community organizing. That's not going to happen. So we have to figure out new ways to do it that are independent, on the cheap, and actual real grassroots movements that don't presuppose politics based on demographics. Everyone's welcome. All right, thanks, thanks, Mark. Wait, wait, wait. wait. Sorry, <laughs> sorry, sorry, sorry. sorry. Okay. All right, you one know, more um, minute. One more minute. Yeah. I've only spoken for not even a minute. The TA is doing the 25-year transportation plan. They are $3 billion out of a $4 billion for doing the existing transportation infrastructure and pipeline. Okay. There's $10 billion for the greenhouse gases upon which all this is supposed to be predicated and all these plans, mm -hmm. yet there's no money for that $10 billion. On Eastern neighborhoods, right? The nonprofits said they had our back. We got played on Eastern neighborhoods and Market Octavia, and the Mission District is now a free fire zone for luxury condos. We have to develop new models for community organizing that are not so narrowly focused and tailored and leverage the resources of everyone in this room and in the city to take the city away from the neoliberal imperative. That's got to happen. It's going to be working with us. Thanks, Mark. Yeah. 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 Fernando's bringing the mic. Thank you. My name is David Seitz. I'm members of uh, San Francisco Mall and uh, Board of Directors of Freedom West Homes, which is only about uh, four blocks away from here, OK? Today we're, we're, we're talking about community actions. I'm coming over here to learn, as well as to ask for help of everybody. Not 10 years, but one year from now, not four months from now, but right now, okay? Because our community needs, uh, needs action right now. Because at this point, HUD is putting our, our community a four block, okay? Of over a thousand people in foreclosure, okay? And right now, the city got, uh, mayor's office is so-called hiring somebody, I think, who, who has 
they all have a developer's background. They're going to come over here, come to our community. So the, I, know, I, I pretty much know what the solution is. Okay? It's very, very, very obvious. Okay? Because right now, they want us to come up with a plan within a month. Otherwise, they're going to come down here for foreclosure. Okay? Foreclosure means that uh, ours right now is a co-op, and they're going to push us as a rental, and they're, they're, they're going to bring a partner, a developer partner, from here to control everything uh, over the door. So if there's any time for organizing, it's right now. Okay? I've already organized my community for the past three years, but right now we need that. We right now we need help from everyone in the everyone in the city, from labor, from, from labor, from all the candidates we can come over. Yeah, Thanks. Can you, why don't you uh, do you have a, a website or a contact information you can give people so they can get in touch with if they want to help? Yes, definitely. Okay, because I myself have a blog already. Okay, and I'm why don't you tell people where they can how they can plug in? That's the blog. What's the name of your blog? Freedom West Day. My name's David. Freedom West is the place. Freedom West Day at blogspot.com. Okay. Great. Thank you very much for bringing that up. I appreciate it. Okay. Something I want to look at. Because right now our position is made not in San Francisco, but from someplace far away in LA, from the enforcement office. Yep. Thanks so much. We have time for a couple more questions. Here, right here. I live in right down the street of Dolores Street. I am living through the diaspora of what is happening in the mission. Um, all my neighbors are gone. My community stores are gone. All of these things have happened in the course of the last three or four years. And um, I have an idea about below market rate housing. Uh, because I'm always afraid that I'm going to be the next one to be evicted. At the moment, I am a protected tenant, but that may not last for very long. So, of course, I've got my eyes open, I apply, I look here, that. All of the below market rate housing that I have seen is disgusting. If it's not good for people to live, they don't have decent kitchens where you can cook, you're crammed into classified spaces, there's not enough room for a family. So I say, why does the city have to get involved in below market rate housing in that context? Why not buy the buildings and let the people stay in the buildings and have city workers, union workers, help restructure the buildings? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Why do we have to build these developments? What is the point besides the fact that so many, even nonprofit organizations, I mean, I'm sure the people on their boards make a lot more money than the people who I work with for myself. Why can't we stay in our homes? Why can't we have what they call liquid limited equity solution? Whereby instead of building all of these buildings, you know, help us buy our units. I can afford $100,000, that's it. I can't afford a below market rate house of $399,000. I never will be able to afford anything like that. So I say, why can't we take the conversation in a different direction? Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. All right, one more question. Yeah, all the way back. Hi, everybody. Um, so, I mean, I wanted to talk to Maria's issue of, hey, Maria, um, to around statewide organizing. Um, I think that's a really important issue. Just recently, like in the last two weeks, there was a bill up um, at the state legislature to be able to even provide additional protections or additional solutions for people losing their deposit. Something so simple as getting your deposit back. It died. It, they sold us out. You know, basically, people who have run on the platform of helping working class people voted against it. Yes. You know, and so in terms of where we are at the state level, it's pretty bad. I mean, if we think that here it's difficult, try organizing in Merced. Like, try organizing in Fresno. Uh, places where the realtors are on the city council, you know? So in terms of what we're doing at the state level, it's really important to recognize that there are efforts actually to work at the state level. For example, Gen, who's on the panel, and I are both on the, um, what I went wrong with Ted Gullickson and other people, are on the Board of Tenants Together, which is a statewide tenant rights organization that we're actually trying to figure out solutions at a statewide level. We're going to Merced, we're going to Fresno, and talking to people there about what kind of rights they need to be able to stay in their homes. Um, and it's a really tough fight. If we think we have it tough here, it is like so many times tougher in a lot of these communities. Um, so just to kind of put a push out that 
it's good that we're talking about this, but it, here, and we also need to get out of ourselves and go to these communities wow. and talk to people that are actually, have so many less protections than we do. Um, so along with that, so just to a little, a small plug, uh, that tomorrow, actually Tennis Together is celebrating five years of being, um, fighting for state rights. <laughs> So if you guys want to come out, celebrate the you know tenant-friendly condo conversion, um, you know victory we just had. That would be great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Wrapping this up for us, um, Tanya. What district is this? Oh, where is your state? Thanks to uh, Supervisor Moore. Where are all the well, I know, where's, where's the District 8 supervisor? They were all invited. <laughs> Trust me, Trust me, they were all invited. I know that uh, Supervisor Campos had a conflict. There's another event that he had to go to tonight. Um, and I know that Supervisor Mar is here. The others were all invited, and we can see him in Thank you, Supervisor. Uh, wrapping this up, I'm going to introduce uh, Rachel Berhinski. Um, We'll get over to Peter for a second, and then I'm going to introduce Rachel Berhinski. That would be Dr. Rachel Berhinski, uh, recently the PhD at who is now an urban studies professor at the University of San Francisco and is a former Bay Guardian intern, former Bay Guardian reporter, um, longtime writer on urban affairs for the Guardian, who is now Dr. Berhinski. She'll be following us to wrap it up. And after that, I'm going to just say a couple words about how we can continue this conversation. Go ahead, Peter. So, uh, folks, I just want to um, highlight a few things that I heard today, uh, and, and I will be quick. Um, but first of all, and Rachel can punctuate this, we have about 135 people come tonight. That's a good turnout. Thank you all very much. Um, Rachel, I think there's been talk about some solutions, some action you can get involved in. It's also in your program. Um, but, you know, a lot of the discussion tonight, to me, just raises, uh, in many respects, for Plan Barrier, the same questions that we've been grappling with and we grapple with every day in our work. Who gets to live here and who gets to work here? Right? That's the question. Plan Bay Area doesn't, in and of itself, raise new questions. It just raises the heat by making more assumptions about growth in our city, and we're still left with the question of how do we solve for that in an equitable way that creates justice on the ground and doesn't abstract the, the unintended consequences. Um, some highlights from the panelists. Uh, everybody was fantastic. Gan kicks it off with, is this our vision, right? It's, it's a regional vision, it's an agency vision, it's a kind of a technocrat vision. But is it our vision from a community standpoint? There are a series of maps on the wall that I'd, I'd like to suggest you all peek at, but uh, as Gan pointed out, you know, we have this, I call it a train wreck. You know, you look at one map that is uh, the priority development areas, where from a kind of a, a planning standpoint, should most of the growth go? Where should we direct growth from a smart growth standpoint? Map number two is where currently do we have vulnerable communities, low income communities of color, working class communities that are at a high risk of displacement? And then you put map one on top of map two, and voila, you essentially have our smart growth regional future is our working class and low income communities of today. That's a problem, and it's not necessarily one that we are making hyperbole about, it's just the way that the development plans kind of put this question to us to solve. Um, what I heard, it's just an interesting, you know, Cindy put down not just growth for growth's sake, we really have to ask the question about who's benefiting from this and how do we make growth something that creates real community benefit, not just growth because it's a good thing to do. We're not just gonna sort of take one for the team at a regional level, and have folks' lives impacted as a consequence. Uh, I think Maria raised a similar uh, point in concluding what kind of development are we prioritizing in our neighborhoods? It's not just development, but what kind of development? And who gets it? And what do we get out of it? Uh, Bob, I, I really like, and I know you're involved in the regional work, you know, the, the plans suffer in many ways, but they, they also suffer from a top-down perspective rather than the bottom-up one. How do we grow a movement that actually shapes these visions for the region that's based in people's lives, not necessarily just in kind of planners' worlds. And then I think Mike, uh, you know, I just really very much and maybe mostly compelled by Mike's statements because I come out of the housing world, but the workforce, the labor perspective, you know, who's getting the jobs and are those jobs and people able to live in San Francisco 
you know, that's, that's, a, that's a math question. Are the wages equal to the cost of housing? But you put it into this perspective of saying the changing demographic of San Francisco affect the politics of protest. That's right on. I mean, you know, that's what's made San Francisco what it is. It's because people have struggled for, for this place to be a great place, whether it's in the labor movement or housing or anything else. And if you don't have people here to struggle, you know, this could be easy. Uh, so the changing demographics matter a lot to the work we do if we want to be an activist city, and we still are. Um, real quickly, uh, Council of Community Housing Organizations, Choo Choo, as you may know us, you know, we've commented on Plan Bay Area. Uh, we, we wrote our official <coughs> comments to the, to the record. Um, this is very basic stuff. San Francisco is intended to take 25% of all the housing growth of the so-called top 15 cities. That's a tremendous amount of new housing units. Number two, the plan only plans for growth, it does uh, housing, it doesn't tell you how it's paid for. So simply planning for housing doesn't get you housing, we know that. Number three, if we're to extrapolate that San Francisco share of the regional growth, we would need over a 30 year period about 35,000 units of affordable housing. And I'm saying affordable here is below 80% of the AMI, okay, so you can take your different cuts. 35,000 units. That is on an average basis 1,100 units of affordable housing that we would produce. We do maybe four to 500 a year. So that's talking more than double. Uh, and, and there's no money for that. And there's no money for that. And no tools to get your money. Yeah, and no tools to get your money. Right. Anyway, and I was wondering, you know, this is, this is again, not to exaggerate, it's just the truth. We build a certain amount. We got $1.3 billion in Prop C for 30 years. As Gan aptly pointed out, if you do some back of the envelope math, we're still about $5 billion short. Now, I think that, you know, we would actually say, great, we'll accept this growth projection if you find $5 billion for us, but until then, we have a shortfall. Which leads to, I think, the real punchline here. The, the chart up on the wall shows you that this current proposed plan would increase the level of risk of displacement from the existing conditions, existing conditions of 21% to 36%. So it's, 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 you know, this is the, the, if you will, collateral damage of smart growth. Therefore, we concluded, and this was printed in Tim's article, so I'll read it again, it would be irresponsible to advance a plan that purports to improve the region's communities as population grows, while simultaneously that plan presents greater risk and uncertainty for many vulnerable communities that already experience today under current real estate development pressure, right? I mean, it, that's basically not acceptable. Now, uh, Bob pointed out the six wins for equity has the environment, equity, and jobs alternative, which actually does substantially better as an outcome, but it does still need more. Uh, and it's a starting point as a platform that our organization has been involved in. And it's, a, I think, a bridge to Rachel if she wants to conclude. I think we should get involved in pushing back on this plan. It's easy to just discount it, uh, and we've done a good critique. We also need to get involved in that movement, as Bob pointed out, and take our ideas and our action and push back and make it better or have some kind of an alternative to it. Those are my concluding remarks. Rachel. Um, I'm on cleanup. And you have to have a PhD to be on cleanup. So um, I want to take this out. A lot has been said tonight, and I don't have, I don't want to add uh, new facts and figures. Um, but I just want to say this is an amazing group of people. Um, you're engaged and you're active, and it's totally essential. And I think, you know, it, I, I, I want to echo a lot of things that people here said that you, you know. What Peter said about San Francisco, you know, San Francisco is the place that it is because people have kept fighting. And yes, the Western edition was torn apart in the 1960s, and that's the story that always comes up when people talk about displacement. But then it was bit by bit, partly put back together. And I think it's, it's a piece of the story that people forget. 
to, to remind ourselves that community pressure has been essential over time, over and over and over. The affordable housing, that, now, so I'm not claiming that the Western edition is anything like what it was, um, so, so don't quote me on that. I saw a few frowns. But the point is that any affordable housing that exists in the Western edition, that exists south of Market, that exists in the Mission, that exists on Bayview uh, Hill, Hundred Point Hill, um, is there because of community pressure, because people got organized and found points of unity and kept trying and trying and trying. And so um, I'm really excited to see how many people came here tonight to talk about this pretty obscure kind of distant plan that I think forces us to do something that we must do, which is think regionally. And I think that it's essential, partly because, as, as people have said here today, that, you know, I, I live in Oakland now. I, I was kind of displaced out of the city. It wasn't the worst story uh, of the many stories that you've heard and that you've seen happening all around you. But that, you know, San Francisco is far beyond the borders of San Francisco, and we have to remember that. In some ways, we're just sort of a, a, a suburb of Silicon Valley, right? So we have to think of ourselves as both smaller than we are and bigger than we are. And, and I think that um, there have been a lot of really important points made tonight. I hope, and I think we all hope, all of us who, who were organizing this, that, that people will leave here inspired to act even more. A lot of people in this room are, are very involved activists and have been for many, many years. And so those of you who haven't been, I hope you'll leave here, leave your, your email out front so that you can get emails from the organization that put this together. And there are a bunch of, um, bunch of points of intervention, ways that you can be involved coming up. They're in the flyer that some of you got. If you leave your email out front, then you'll get it in your email. Uh, and the first, the first place that you can participate is just is this Friday. At 9.30 in the morning, someone was talking about how these meetings are only at night. This is a morning meeting for those of you who can make it. Um, ABAG MTC hearing, it's a really important hearing. And then on the 20th, there's another one. Uh, there's an MTC meeting on July 10th and on. And so it, it's all in here. We can tell you about those dates. Um, the other thing is that one of the organizations that put this together tonight is, is this new think tank called Urban Idea, which is a group of people who are trying to produce new knowledge and new information about the city to help uh, solidify the conversation around how to make change in San Francisco. How, you know, if there's going to be growth, how you can have growth without displacing people. I think that uh, displacement should be a planning metric. If you're going to come up with a plan like Plan Bay Area and you can see that there's displacement, you can map it, you can show us where it's going to be, well, that might, needs to not just be part of the kind of, that you know, you look in the future, you see that coming. So, so that means you don't do that development, and you can figure out how to do it differently. Um, that's what we need to work towards. That's a long-term plan, but in the short term, um, there are all these uh, ways that you can get involved. There's also a, a regional working group of Choo Choo, and I think again, if you put your name on the table out front, that you'll get information about it. And am I missing other few other moments where people can get involved? I think that's a lot of it. And uh, Tim, do you have any closing words? Yeah, uh, thank you, Rachel. Thank you. Um, this is a start. Tonight is a start. Tonight we've got 135 people in the room, and we've got a panel who's talking about this. This is, as one of the panelists said, this is, or somebody said from the audience, this is like the biggest thing that nobody knows about. Um, well, we know about it now, and there's a lot of us here, and we're going to keep this going. So please, Give us your contact information. We are going to continue to hold meetings like this. We're going to continue to look at alternatives, discussions, how we can organize around this. The San Francisco Bay Guardian has a politics blog at sfbg.com where we're going to continue this discussion. There's always a few crazy trolls, just ignore them. Um, where we can continue this discussion and talk about strategies and what we can do next. This is an ongoing process. I really appreciate everybody being here tonight. Thank you so much for coming. And thanks to all of our panelists for coming and spending the weekend here.